So today we have um, Dr. Elias Jaffa, who is an emergency physician and co-founder of At Global Pocus. He's talking to us tonight on ultrasound guided nerve blocks all the way from North Carolina. And he's got up out of bed really early this morning to join us. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, Elias. And I'm going to just hand over to you now so that uh, we can get ourselves underway. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Uh, if you'd rather ask questions off the record, we can uh, do that after the session. So let me know. Um, over to you, Elias. Yeah, right on. Hey, guys. Um, so I'm Eli Jaffa. Um, I apologize in advance for a couple of things. Number one, um, my baby just woke up again and is probably screaming in the background. So I'm sorry if you can hear that. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure one or two of my toddlers have just like snuck out of their room and then back in. So like, if there's critters running around, um, it's like 530 in the morning here. Uh, so yeah. I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, so let's talk about some form um, blocks. So uh, when I was in fellowship, I uh, one of the things that was very lacking in, um, in our curriculum because I was the first fellow and I was kind of doing things on the fly um, was we didn't have really an established um, nerve block um, curriculum uh, when, uh, when I was at Duke primarily because of uh, some... Uh, kind of political machinations upstairs. It was always difficult to kind of like, you didn't, you never wanted to step on other people's toes really. And other groups um, kind of had a, uh, kind of had the the field of nerve blocks kind of tidied away. Um, that being said, now that I'm in South Carolina, um, I work at a very small rural hospital and there's nobody else there. <laughs> like it's literally me and the hospitalist. So um, it actually is a really nice option uh, at times for, um, for pain control. And so I wanted to talk, um, starting from a case um, that I had a couple of months ago. Uh, and I wanted to just run through like my thinking on it and, and how forearm blocks um, managed to be a really good option for, uh, for analgesia. So um, to start with the case, um, it was like, I think I was showing up for my 5 p.m. shift maybe. Um, and a gentleman comes in um, and he's the first guy I see and he has a laceration here. So he had actually been stabbed by a sapling. He was cutting saplings. I don't know why, um, but he got stabbed right there and it was like in plane with the hand. Um, so it was, it was oriented kind of like in the same um, plane like that with the hand and it penetrated fairly deeply, um, which presented a number of challenges um, or sorry, it was between the, the webbing, the web space, of the first two fingers of the index and middle finger. Um, so it presented a number of challenges. Um, first of all, there's not a lot of space there. So I'm going to have to manipulate his hands quite a bit and that's going to be really painful. Number two, it's organic material that's being penetrated with a penetrating injury um, rather than just like a crush injury or as like an abrasion. Um, so the likelihood is that there's going to be some material left over in there and organic material is just like the bane of the existence of all emergency physicians. Like it's so miserable because like you leave even a tiny bit there and it's going to form an abscess. And third is that, um, uh, so anyway, so the, the reason I bring that up is because he's going to need a pretty decent washout and that's going to be almost impossible for him to tolerate um, without adequate analgesia. Um, and then the third reason is because it's the hand and it's a distal extremity and it's got poor blood flow sometimes. And so that's always a challenge. So you got to be really, really diligent about how you repair those and how you irrigate them. Um, so that was the challenge. Um, the other issue was that it was fairly deep. So like, just even if I was able to kind of like finagle a needle in there to get local anesthetic, um, injected into the, into the entire area, which would be a really painful process in, in, uh, regardless of how I did it. Um, I don't think that I would have been able to get it deep enough into the deeper layers that I was going to have to repair and wash out, um, to actually give him adequate analgesia. So, uh, so that was the challenge I was facing and I didn't think that local anesthetic would work. So um, I hearken back to my uh, to my fellowship days, and let me just share my screen. Um, can everybody see the? What is this? Cool. Okay. Um, so this is um, me with my fellowship crew, um, and this is officially hashtag Throwback Thursday. Um, so yeah, the um, the woman standing at the ultrasound machine was my fellowship director, Eric Vietnangsen. Um, one of the subsequent fellows uh, is the one with the ultrasound probe. Um, and then one of our residents at the time, uh, who I think is a third year now, 
um, is Ken Kennedy, the one with the syringe. Um, and so we had like a two person set up with, uh, with a nerve block and they were doing some form blocks on me. The result of this was that I actually ended up getting um, a radial and an ulnar block on one arm done um, on me and then uh, a median block done on the other arm. And after that was done, I literally was like, oh, you know what? It feels kind of numb. Let me sketch out exactly where it is because I noticed there was a really sharp demarcation. And so I actually went through and I marked off exactly where uh, exactly where I was having uh, numbness. And so, uh, so we've got the median nerve distribution here, um, excuse me, where most of the, uh, pretty much all the thenar eminence, most of the, um, of the volar surface of the, of the hand, uh, including the thumb and two, uh, two and a half of the fingers. It, it literally was like straight down the middle of that, of that third finger. Um, and then the backs of these fingers and just a bit of the webbing space, just about half of the webbing space was anesthetized um, for all these fingers. Um, and then the radial nerve distribution uh, was the next one. Uh, so you can see here that it goes to the other part of the thumb. So it pretty much equally splits the thumb there um, with the entire tip being taken by the median nerve, um, with the radial nerve getting the, the uh, dorsal aspect of it, as well as the dorsal aspect of that, just that proximal bit of those fingers and the rest of the webbing space for that first and second uh, digit. Um, and then this whole area of the, um, of the, this whole superficial area of the wrist there. Uh, and then finally the ulnar branch, um, which really was only just like the lateral aspect of the wrist and the hypothenar eminence, um, and a little bit of the pinky. Um, so that, uh, being said, so that, that was what I was looking at there. Um, so if you remember, uh, can you guys see my mouse? Okay. I'm assuming that that's a yes. Um, yes. Okay, cool. So, um, so if you remember the, the injury was like right here and it was right in the middle of the webbing space. And so what I ended up doing was I chose to do a radial block as well as a median block. And that pretty much anesthetized this entire section of the hand front and back, which included that web space. And also uh, interestingly, the deeper structures. Um, and to jump forward before we go into the gritty details of the blocks, um, uh, he basically tolerated uh, like 15 minutes of being washed out under a tap, um, including me doing some like pressure injection with the syringe, um, as well as like three or four uh, fairly large stitches in that area came together perfectly. And he literally walked out saying that that was the best experience in the emergency department he'd ever had. Um, and the blocks took me maybe... 15 minutes all told to perform. Um, and so it was like a super, super, really nice option. Um, so that, uh, that was like the, that was the thing that sold me on like every emergency doc should be able to do this like hundred percent. Um, just cause like for those rare kind of circumstances where you just have no better options, uh, it's a really nice one. So, um, so let's get into the details just a little bit. I've got a couple of clips from his actual, um, experience. So this is his median nerve right here. And there's my needle, uh, coming in from the side. Um, and I'm doing an in-plane injection in this particular case. And unfortunately, I've only got the six second clip. So I don't have the, the much longer clips of, of the injection itself, but I've got a page pulled up on the web that I'm gonna uh, walk through in a second. Um, and then the radial nerve here. Um, so this is the radius, the bone down here. Uh, this is the radial artery up over here. And this is me coming in from, um, uh, from the, this would have been, I think the lateral aspect um, of his uh, of his wrist, um, and then injecting right there. You can see just the beginnings of the hydrodissection, uh, which is the term we'll talk about in just a moment. And then the second clip is a little bit more. You can see more of that interstitial fluid, and that's all the anesthetic that I've just uh, pumped into the area, um, and it's starting to kind of dissect out a lot of these uh, different tissues here. Um, so that's kind of what you'll see. So this is this is just a still from I think the radial nerve uh, block. So there's the um, there's the nerve right there, uh, and then this is my needle tip, uh, which you can see some ring down artifact from, and you can just see like a little bit of fluid kind of tracking along these tissues. Um, and this is kind of like the perfect spot of where you kind of want to be injecting at some point. Um, so let's let's talk gritty details. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share a different screen. 
uh, and we'll run through that. Um, okay, so this is a website um, that's put up by Highland Hospital. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but um, Highland is a um, is a hospital. It's a level two trauma center out in uh, Oakland, California, just outside of San Francisco. Um, so they are like in the nitty gritty um, for trauma, but they are also well known for their um, for their ultrasound guided blocks um, website. Um, so their program puts up this really great website, highlandultrasound.com, if anybody's interested. Um, I highly recommend it because it's a, just an absolute treasure trove of information and, and education. So highly recommended. Um, so this goes over this. The first thing it kind of shows is this um, uh, is this uh, breakdown of like what injuries might be uh, useful to block. Um, and so if you have like any kind of like crush injury or major uh, uh, deforming injury of the hand, like you're probably going to need all three of them. Um, if you've got thumb index or middle uh, or ring finger injuries, the radial and median, like I was just doing uh, in order to get the volar and dorsal aspects of the hand um, of those particular fingers. And then a boxer's fracture is most typically the fourth or the fifth digits, um, not because they're boxers, but because they are not boxers specifically and they don't know how to punch. And so they end up uh, cocking the wrist to the side instead of doing it kind of in line and hitting with the first two knuckles, they hit with the, uh, the third, sorry, fourth and fifth knuckles and end up breaking one of these metacarpals. Um, and so as you saw, like the surface of the ulnar block was not particularly um, large, uh, but it does anesthetize the underlying tissues. And so if you've got a boxer's fracture, you can actually anesthetize that fairly well with an ulnar block. Um, there are a couple of different spots that you can uh, hit these blocks. Most typically, you'll want to get them in the, the mid forearm, give or take. So like right about midway between the wrist and the elbow, although the ulnar um, block can be performed at the elbow. Um, it's a bit of an awkward positioning. I've actually got some pictures of me with uh, with my my uh, my Duke colleagues uh, doing injections there. Um, but the funny bone gets hit, and that's the ulnar nerve getting a little radiculopathy um, when you smack it on something um, because uh, it's just very very superficial in that spot. And so that's a nice area to um, to do it um, if somebody's got a little extra kind of meat. Um, Obviously, I do not, so it's uh, it's a bit challenging because your probe kind of gets in the way. Um, it's so so superficial, um, but it can be a nice spot to block it. But it does become more superficial kind of towards the mid forearm, and that's really where um, that's where you want to hit it so that it's close enough to the surface that you can actually get to it with a relatively not super long needle. Um, but not so superficial that you're getting in your own way with your probe. Um, so there are two techniques to do nerve blocks typically. Um, there's in-plane techniques and out-of-plane techniques. Um, so the in-plane technique, you kind of saw very briefly when I was um, showing that those first clips in the picture, um, which basically are, you've got your probe and then in the same plane, you've got your needle. And so you're coming in either lateral or medial and then um, basically trying to get it so that you're visualizing your entire needle um, uh, or at least your entire needle towards the needle tip. Um, uh, and then the nerve itself is going to be out of plane. So it's going to be a short axis view of the nerve and a long axis view of the needle. And then alternatively, which you can see demonstrated on the screen here is the in plane technique where, um, uh, sorry, the out of plane technique where you've got the probe in short axis, uh, to the, uh, to the arm. And then, uh, you're getting again, a short axis view of the nerve itself. And then you're coming in and you're just going to see the needle tip only. Um, and that can be demonstrated right here. So this is a, this is an out of plane axis or an in plane axis, sorry. Um, similar to what I was doing a minute ago. Um, and then the, um, out of plane where you've got the median nerve here and then just the needle tip right here. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're more comfortable doing it this way, then that's one way to do it. Or for whatever reason, there's some anatomic reason why you can't uh, reasonably get in from the, the lateral aspect um, or the medial aspect, then an in-plane or an out-of-plane um, uh, view might be the one. Um, I personally much prefer the in-plane technique uh, shown here, uh, just because it's easier for me to visualize the needle tip and, um, and uh, especially when I'm trying to get like uh, all the way around a nerve, um, it's uh, it's just easier for me to not like go straight through the nerve um, uh, to visualize that. Uh, and especially when I'm teaching, it's hard to um, 
uh, it's, it's oftentimes hard for me to trust that like the person's actually seeing the needle tip itself and not some part of the needle shaft. Um, the uh, so the, the basic technique is that you're going to identify whatever nerve that you're, um, that you're working on. Um, so, uh, median, uh, is obviously going to be like roughly in the middle of the forearm right here. Um, the radial will be towards the radial side. Um, and you can kind of like find the radial artery and then track it back a little ways until you can see the, the radial artery kind of pop and, and congeal. Um, and then the ulnar is going to be a little bit more towards the ulnar aspect and the same idea uh, applies there. Um, when you get closer to the forearm, those nerves tend to spread out and they tend to send off all their offshoots into the superficial tissues. And so the idea is that you want it proximal enough that you've got a true nerve bundle. Um, as opposed to just a kind of a, a scattered array of nerves. Um, so it should look something like what it looks like on the screen here, where you've got this little, um, uh, almost like honeycomb appearance, um, uh, similar to you, what you would see if you were looking at like, um, like a really hyperprolific ovary is the thing that comes to mind. I don't know why, um, but it's got all these little bubbles basically in there. And that's um, uh, those uh, hypoechoic or anechoic bubbles are just like the individual nerve fibers um, or bundles inside that larger nerve sheath. Uh, so the idea is that you're going to bring the needle in from one side or the other. Um, and I typically choose that side based on what the intervening structures are. So if there's a big artery on one side, I'm going to try to avoid going through that side. Um, and you want to plan out like, okay, what's the, what's the trajectory of my needle going to be? And am I going to be able to avoid any of the major structures in the way? Or is there something that I'm going to have to push my needle through? Um, and, and I got to plan for that, whether I'm going to go over it, under it, or, or somehow get around it in, a, in another way. Um, the flatter the angle, the better you'll be able to visualize your needle. Um, and so typically when I'm doing forearm blocks, I'm coming in almost from like the side of the arm, as opposed to starting on the surface, on the, on the dorsal surface and going down and across um, at like a 45 or, or steeper or, or shallower angle. I'm usually coming in from the side and trying to get it almost a zero degree angle um, with, uh, with respect to uh, the probes horizon, if that makes sense. Um, so this is the surface of the, uh, of the skin. So I'm trying to come in from like the side. So like the forearm wraps around this way and I'm trying to come in almost straight across as opposed to like, uh, with a bit of a downward angle. And that just helps you visualize the needle better because that, that sharper, um, uh, the closer to perpendicular you are to the, to the, uh, plane of insonation, the, the brighter the reflection is going to be. Uh, and so then as you introduce your needle, you're basically going to bring it as close as you can to the nerve sheath without actually entering the nerve itself. Um, and then you want to make sure that obviously you aspirate a little bit and then start injecting. And the idea is that you want to hydro dissect the nerve out. Um, so if you inject kind of out here, you'll start to see some, some fluid and maybe some air bubbles start to infiltrate into the tissues, but you, you will probably see it collect in a fairly local space. There's a, there's a fascial plane that kind of wraps around these nerves, both, uh, the outside of the muscles and also the, the outside of the nerve itself. And the idea is you want to get it within the nerve sheath without actually going into the nerves. Uh, into the nerve fibers themselves. And that's a very delicate process. It's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and so you want to just do a little bit at a time. As it starts to get into the correct plane, you'll start to see uh, some of the fluid kind of wrapping around the, the nerve tissue itself. And it'll give you actually better visualization of the needle tip because now you've got this little internal, um, uh, this internal water bath almost that's uh, allowing you hopefully better visualization of the needle tip. Um, and then as you kind of fill that space and there's more fluid, then you can kind of bring the needle anterior or superficial and deep to the, to the nerve and just fill that whole space. And the idea is basically that you want to just completely surround the nerve as much as you can with, uh, with your anesthetic. Um, and then it just kind of infiltrates into the nerve itself and kills the, um, the sensation to that distribution. And that's, why you want to get it where it's a, a true nerve bundle as opposed to just kind of more spread out just because you'll you'll use less anesthetic um and you'll uh be able to get a, a greater density of block um and so this is uh you know an example of the radial nerve and the nerve uh, the needle path there um closer to the uh this is like a an upper arm block basically um and that's that site there. Um, uh, 
there are a lot of discussions that can be had about medications um, that I haven't really prepared a whole lot for, but there's uh, a variety of different anesthetics that we use. Um, in my shop, we tend to use primarily um, lidocaine, uh, 1% without epi. Um, you can use it with epi if you would like to. Um, uh, and it'll, it'll, uh, increase the length of time that that block will be effective um, primarily just by by uh, causing some vasoconstriction and making it so that the um, uh, that the anesthetic doesn't wash out as quickly basically um, longer acting things like uh, ripivacaine or bupivacaine are also very helpful um, so lidocaine's uh, time of effect without uh, epi is probably within like uh, somewhere around 30 to 45 minutes or so of, of effective block, maybe a little bit less depending on what you're doing um, and how much you use the bupivacaine and the ripivacaine, typically a couple of hours. Um, so I think for ripivacaine, it's saying like six to eight hour block. Um, it's, it's a very dense block and it's a very long acting block. So that can be a very helpful thing. Um, the things that you run into um, that you wanna be careful of when you're thinking about regional anesthesia are, um, you uh, want to use as little as you can. Um, uh, you want to avoid injecting into the into the nerve itself because you can actually cause permanent nerve damage if you do like a direct injection into the nerve itself um, with enough uh, with enough volume. Um, excuse me. Um, you want to make sure that you are, if it's relevant, monitoring for compartment syndrome. Um, so not necessarily from the amount of an anesthetic that you're injecting, uh, but more so because like they won't be able to feel their extremity. And so they won't be able to tell you if they're, if they're having paresthesias or if they're having increased pain um, from, uh, from another injury that would be causing um, compartment syndrome. Otherwise, so you really want to be cautious about stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and you wanna make sure that you're trying to avoid systemic toxicity. So there are dosing guidelines. Um, so don't exceed this particular amount, this many milligrams per kilogram in your patients. Um, uh, so some of the things you'll see are, um, uh, I'm actually forgetting most of the most of the early signs of toxicity. Um, but obviously, the end of uh, the end of the line in in toxic uh, uh, in toxidromes is seizure, coma, and then death. Um, so obviously, you want to avoid that. Um, uh, I think typically, like tachycardia and flushing and things like that would be um, some of the earlier signs. Uh, the solution is intralipid. Um, so if you don't have intralipid available in your hospital, you probably don't want to be messing around with this um, until you have some method of reversal. Um, and there's a couple of good papers out there that I can, um, I can gather a couple of resources and post them uh, when this goes to YouTube. Uh, so, so anybody watching down the line can, can have access to those, um, uh, to those resources, but, um, but basically spelling out the, uh, the, the risks of systemic toxicity and the dosing of intralipid and, and how to manage the, um, the systemic toxicity that can occur when you say inject into a vein or, a, uh, or an artery by accident. Um, uh, some people will do just as a side, uh, some people will do a combination of, of meds. So they'll do like a one-to-one -one ratio of, uh, bupipacaine and lidocaine. Um, so they get that quicker onset and also the longer, um, uh, the longer acting and they'll use less bupivacaine, which is a little bit more toxic um, and a little bit more risky, uh, or they'll use epinephrine in the lidocaine. Um, and those will both uh, increase the duration of the block's uh, effectiveness. Um, and that's pretty much it uh, that I've got prepared. So uh, if we want, let's, uh, we can stop the sharing and just kind of Anybody who wants to jump in, we can chat about uh, techniques or, or, you know, nerve block choices or whatever else. Thanks, Elias. That was great. I um I like your way of refreshing your anatomy. Let's just give yourself a nerve block and and map it out. I'm sure. Oh yeah, it sticks I literally when you pull up those way. pictures every yeah. single time. I'm like, which block would this would work on this? And I put I have a I have an album on my phone, and I'm just like, go back to that album and just be yeah. like, okay, this is the one I want. <laughs> it's just yeah. way better than the anatomy drawings, you know. Yeah, no, the, well, that's one way to learn your anatomy. Um, and, and I'm a big fan of the Highland Highland Ultrasound website as well. I only think nerve block related. It's just a, an amazing website with lots and lots of information. 
So I highly recommend that one. Does anyone have any questions that they want to, or cases that they've had or experience that they've had questions for a life? Peter, off you go. Hi, hi, sir. Thanks for that presentation, mate. Um, um, just one, uh, I mean, uh, I was at Duke, uh, I worked at Duke as an, as an anesthesiologist in uh, two, let me see, oh my God, 1991. Oh my God. Anyway, look, uh, one thing I thought I'd uh, just bring up as a, as a comment is that um, uh, if the patients are going to surgery, sometimes it's a good idea before you make it impossible for the plastic surgeon to see if there's any nerve injury is to document that it's intact before you do the block or let them know just from a medical legal perspective, that's all. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, the more documentation about their, pre, um, their pre-procedural uh, nerve vascular status, the better off you will be, yeah. Um, uh, the other thing that will piggyback off of that is that um, it's really important to coordinate with your surgical staff and with your surgical crew. Um, so if you're doing this from the emergency department, um, like I said, like there's a lot of kind of turf battles that are really important. And that was a, a big reason that we just hadn't had the time to coordinate with those groups to um, to, to sort out the exact um, relationship that we would have with other services. But in my particular hospital, like if I do a single shot nerve block, that's the only regional anesthesia that someone's going to get potentially um, for the next like 12 hours, because they're just not going to sit like, there's no ortho specialists at our hospital anymore, even. Um, and so they're going to have to travel, you know, an hour down the road. We're going to have to coordinate yeah, sure, that. There's sure. usually no beds these days. So like, yeah. um, so, so it's easy for me to do it, but like at a place like Duke, like the, the regional anesthesia team would come downstairs, they would place a catheter. And so if there's already anesthetic in that area, like that's not a great combination. And so that was part of the reason why we didn't want to go there. Um, uh, so yeah, so as a general comment, always make sure that you know exactly what uh, uh, what's going to happen down the line. And you don't want to like, you don't want to screw up the rest of their medical care just because you want to throw in a nerve block. I will say, um, I don't know if you were uh, there. I don't know how, how, far back uh Stu grant was at duke um but this is his book and i just want to make a plug for this um uh this is uh the ultrasound guided regional anesthesia book by uh by Stuart grant and uh david a young um but Stu grant was one of the regional anesthesia folks at duke uh until very recently he's now the, i think the chief of regional anesthesia at unc um but he's a fantastic guy and he's scottish and so like a third of what he says is uh, swear words. A third of what he says is like sheer brilliance. And a third of what he says is just completely incomprehensible. And it's like yeah. always hard to know which third you're kind of traveling in. Um, but he's an amazing guy. And I learned uh, must be all from my Glasgow. early learning. Yeah, I assume so. He's a really solid guy, but, um, but yeah. Thanks Lars. Uh, yeah, Thank yeah, you. for sure. Thanks for the comment. Jeez. Does anyone else have any questions or um, comments? Um, Elias, thanks for getting up early in the morning. Um, uh, I'm, I work in a similar situation to you with no emergency surgery capacity, just, just surgeons who visit the hospital electively and then go back to the, the capital city. Um, and uh, if we get, you know, orthopedics or plastics, as well as trying to find a bed for them somewhere, they're facing a, a, an hour and a quarter, hour and a half trip at least. Um, so, but I suppose what I was wondering is it's great to have these online resources and great to have books and great to go to workshops and courses, but how do you actually get hands-on experience? Because as, as I said, the problem is if you're in a larger hospital, they don't really want to share because they've got anesthesia has got their own trainees that they've got to train because it's expected that they have to learn as part of their curriculum. So the other trainees from the other colleges, whether they're primary care or emergency medicine, they're not going to, they're going to have hard to get a look in. And then in the smaller hospitals, you don't have the expertise, you know, to teach it um, a lot of the time. So, so what's, what's the solution in terms of, actually getting hands on because I haven't found unless you found some I haven't found any great simulators for um for nerve block um so you know like it's not like it can say go to simulation um although um there is some um how do you call it virtual reality stuff um potentially on the horizon for nerve blocks um but 
that's still a little way off and it's going to be pretty expensive to start with that a lot of the smaller hospitals aren't going to pay for and the and the special and, and people like me aren't going to pay for it i mean we pay for the ultrasounds already we're not going to keep paying for everything right. so um so um do you have a what do people how do people get that like it's about getting that confidence for your first five or ten cases you know like it's fine to you know look at books and online but it's not the same as doing it and sticking the needle in you know Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think Peter just mentioned in the, in the chat, go to Zidu, um, which like fully support that one. Um, but you can do all those so, things, but it's not the same as right, doing exactly. it on a real it's very patient. Much not the same, for sure. Exactly. So, so I would say to that, um, those are all valid concerns and they're all very real world concerns. Like I've, I've come across all those, um, both personally and for my, um, for my learners. Um, the, the, kind of three things that come to mind are um, number one, there are some simulator models out there, like not like commercial ones, but like do it yourself models. And I'll try to gather some resources and, and send some links out um, to you guys. Um, there was one that we made in simulation uh, one year at Duke with, um, uh, I think it was basically like chicken breasts and um, some like plungers and stuff. Like there was, it, it ended up being a really like robust model. It didn't, I didn't think it would be, um, but you basically like put a string in a, in one of the tissue planes and then just like squish it down and like hold it pretty firm. Um, and it does a fair job of simulating that, that, um, that perineurium that you're shooting for. And then you actually use like cooking oil um, in your syringe. Um, and it, and it fairly well mimics the feeling, the kind of just like the minutes and minute feeling of, of, um, of the insertion of the needle and then the viscosity of the injection and so forth. Um, again, it's not perfect, but it does do a reasonable job. Um, the second would be find a willing volunteer. Um, and even if you don't do anesthetic, um, which can be a, sometimes a risky thing, um, uh, even just doing like sterile saline injections, like a very small amount of sterile saline injections um, with a partner can be useful. Obviously, like repeated exposures, not really the thing that you can do like multiple ones on the same model. Um, but again, like part of my time in fellowship, I would just like offer to be the model for other people to do nerve blocks so that they could learn. Um, and that was just like, I felt like that was my role there. Now I don't advocate that for everybody to do, you know what I mean? Cause it's not for everyone, but like, it was something I was willing to do. And it was, it was useful for me as well, because I could get that experience of like, what is the distribution of anesthesia in these particular areas? And the third thing is kind of do it on yourself. And that's something I've done quite a bit. Um, it's not easy to do it with a forearm block as it turns out. Um, but the similar technique uh, is involved Involved in doing like foot blocks say um so you can kind of just like prop your foot up and do it like that and so now you have both hands um and then you can kind of practice some of the ankle blocks um to anesthetize like the bottom of the foot say which are also uh, another set of really um effective blocks that i've used at times in my remote emergency department to uh help with like people who've had puncture wounds to the foot that have to get washed out or have like you know something i need to dig out of their foot or whatever um so those are, those are three kind of like not super repeatable, but like theoretically possible ways. Um, yeah. Again, it's, you know, it's kind of a wash ultimately, um, but it's the same with any kind of procedure, right? Like, I mean, if you're, if you're someone who wants to do uh, anything that's going to have a non-zero risk of complications, like, I mean, even splinting, right? Like has some risk, I think theoretically, if you're doing a splint on an otherwise healthy person. So if you do them a thousand of them, like you're going to hurt somebody, um, these, these invasive kind of procedures, they're going to have a much higher risk of, of complication. And so one way or another, there's not much you can do, uh, aside from just like doing it. The, the thing I, I would the say good is, thing is any... the good thing is, you know, you're not getting into more tiger territory, like the neck and, um, sure. And, um, you know, there's only so much that can go wrong. And I suppose for people like me who, you know, um, we're used to being sort of junior doctors with not much supervision. And, you know, our, mm -hmm. our, our lumbar punctures weren't exactly that successful the first few that we tried, you know, and it's sure. a bit of trial and error. Mm -hmm. So I suppose if you look sure. at it that way, you know, whether it's an arthrocentesis or a lumbar puncture, you weren't necessarily that good at them the first few that you weren't, you know, you could have done better. They weren't necessarily fantastic, you know, and in a way this is sort of, even your first intravenous cannulations probably weren't fantastic. So, you know, it's like, well, is it that much different to that? Probably it's not. Honestly, it's just about the willingness to do it. Yeah. That's the hardest thing to get past. 
Alan, I've seen a nice um, a nice nerve block sort of simulator. If you get, you know, that soft cotton um, sort of rope, like a, like a really thick shoelace, and if you soak it in a bit of gel and then put it put a skewer through it so that you can thread it through some like a leg of lamb, um, and that actually simulates a nerve quite nicely. Um, we did that at a, a don't forget the bubbles. Um, workshop I think and it was the most the most like real nerve tissue that I've seen in a simulator the other thing the other comment I'll make is that our on our web page under the resources section and we've just renovated it all as well is the uh, is we've got a whole lot of phantoms that are there that you can link to that have got lots of ideas for uh, how to make your own phantoms and Alan I'll practice on you if you practice on me if you like <laughs> <laughs> I let people do IVs on me a long time ago, but I'm probably too old for that now. But um, I just thought a couple of other things. I think AI will help us in this way because I know Mike Blavis, um, I'm pretty sure he published in the journal, um, the American AIUM journal, um, that um, I think there's some videos online where um, they're working on AI that's getting more and more accurate to identify the nerve, you know, because I suppose that's the other thing it's, it's also developing confidence that you're actually recognizing the anatomy correctly um, and you're blocking a nerve for the first thing and you're blocking the nerve that you want to block, et cetera, et cetera. And I suppose if you can have AI that identifies accurately the nerve and even better ac accurately identifies which nerve it is, and then you've got, you know, those technologies that we've got at the moment with, you know, more needle vision technologies, the, the, you know, needle vis and these other sort of things, I think those things are probably going to, help us with that confidence about getting the structure right and not losing the needle. And, you know, it's like most things, isn't it, Elias? Don't don't run before you can walk. So, you know, I sort of tell people, you know, you want to start tapping a joint, go for, you know, a big target, like, you know, or injecting a joint, go for a knee or a shoulder or a big target before you start doing wrists and ankles, you know? Um, yeah, and for sure. I suppose it's the same thing. I mean, forearms probably a nice, I mean, I think get good at your, your, your uh, femoral nerve block and your fascia iliaca block, you know, those big, big ones uh, that you're going to use a lot. And then and then jump to maybe forearm blocks would be probably the next jump. Sounds quite good. Well, yeah, I'd go I think median nerve reason. first because there's no there's no Yeah, median, there. median the first there's one. There's no yeah. vessel. So um, if you get good at median and nerve before. It's pretty superficial, and... isn't it, really? Yeah. So, yeah. It's really nice and median nerve and it's super easy to identify. So, yeah, I think that's a great one to start with. For sure. And the other thing is, I was going to say is that um, like, I mean, a needle procedure is a needle procedure. I mean, there's a reason that it's the same like CPT code uh, here in the States for billing um, for like any needle entering a cavity. Um, Cause it's in many ways, just the same. Like, I mean, a, a peripheral IV is no different than a, than a central line in the same way that like, you know, uh, a joint injection is basically no different than a needle, uh, than a nerve block. Um, it's just what the target is. So if you're, if you're good with visualizing a needle on ultrasound and, and directing it to the right spot, then all you have is the anatomy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the only thing that kind of stands in your way. And obviously there's like, there's specifics about nerve blocks that, that are important to, uh, to recognize, um, in terms of like the, you know, the pathology and the, and the potential risks and all that. And that's obviously like more of the cognitive aspect aspect of it which is important but uh i think less uh there's less um barriers to learning that stuff you know what i mean um but the hands-on stuff really as long as you're fairly handy with a needle and an ultrasound machine like you're gonna be just fine um uh and the other thing like like you said like at some point you just have to do it and many of us that's how we got our medical training, right? Like you walk into a room and your senior says, yeah, this is the uh, doctor so-and-so he's going to do the procedure. She's going to do the procedure. And they're like, how many have you done? And you're like more than one, which means two, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? not to pull the curtain too far back in the medical industry. But, um, but like, you know, like you said, we all learn at some point and, um, and it's, I think it's important to just have a very open and honest conversation with the patient that you're, um, that you're working with and just say like, Hey, listen, like, this is something that could be very effective. Effective, I think it'll be overall less painful and more successful. If you're willing to go ahead and do it, like this is the, this, these are the risks, like the risks don't just entail like the standard risks. They involve like the procedure confidence, or the, the operator's confidence. And that's true across the board for any procedures. And I personally think that should be part of the conversation in general, but that's just me. Um, 
but, uh, but yeah. And like, and, and so this particular guy, I had that exact conversation with him. I was like, listen, I don't do these blocks very often. So it's possible it's going to suck. Um, and that it's going to be an abject failure, but like the other side of that coin is that it's going to be a very successful thing that will be much less painful. And he was like, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. And I was like, sweet done. And it was, it happened to be very successful in this guy. Now I've had other times where it's been unsuccessful. Um, but I had that conversation beforehand and they were aware of that risk and they were comfortable with it. So it kind of worked out in that way. And you can, so probably, that's what I would say. Is, yeah. And you can probably say like sometimes with some of the ultrasound things that, you know, the, that, you're the best person there is available at the time you know like exactly. sometimes people come in with the expectation they want a first trimester scan and you know and i can say but there is no person on call at this hospital at this time you know right. for this and it's either i do it or you wait you wait till tomorrow or sometimes even wait yep. two three days for it you know and and yep. sometimes when you put it that way they say well i'd rather have you do it even if you haven't done as many as these other people or you don't have For the sure. same, you know, equipment. Um, and, and they're quite happy to at least have some provisional answer. So I suppose, you know, it's those yeah. things, isn't it? You know, you can only offer them the service that is available at the time, isn't it? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's very true in the rural setting more so than, than other places, obviously. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eli. It's uh, It's been great having you on as our guest presenter tonight, and we really do appreciate your time. And um, it's been good learning about the nerve blocks. And Alan, I'm going to, you can bring the give me some confidence to give it a go because I've yeah. just been nervous about it, but I'm, I'm really determined when yeah. I get the opportunity to give it a go. Well, if it's you can bring the saline. It's super worthwhile. And, and, I, and I'll put my arm out. <laughs> oh, if anyone's going to inject into my arm, it's going to be me. All right, then. All right. All right, then. Well, thanks so much, um, everyone, for joining us again. And we get to talk with the rest of the world and get out of our bubble just for a moment in this lockdown craziness. Um, hopefully, we'll see you all again uh, the same, that same time next month. Certainly send me any uh, messages if you've got some specific questions you'd like answered or ideas for what you'd like covered in the next coaching corner. And we'll see you first Thursday of the month at half past seven. All right, then. Signing off now. Happy scanning, everyone. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Bye.